NetSparker, the developers of the only false positive free web application security scanners, enabling you to automatically identify vulnerabilities and security flaws in all of your websites, web applications, and web services. NetSparker scanners are available in two editions, NetSparker Desktop and NetSparker Cloud, the enterprise online scanning service. For more information, visit their website at netsparker.com forward slash security weekly. Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. For more information, visit them on the web at tenable.com. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. Oh, welcome back, everyone. This is Security Weekly, the security news for the week. Before we get started, just a couple of quick announcements for y'all. Besides Tampa, this is a four-night cruise. The conference is full two days at sea with a stop in Cozumel, Mexico. Accepted talks receive a free cabin for two. So, uh, Jack, you and I, you and I should submit and share a cabin. That'd be no. <laughs> I John, would, anyone, I, anyone want to submit like with me and share a cabin? Um, I was, I was uh, actually at this year's. <laughs> Besides Tampa, mm-hmm. when they announced those plans, and I was really psyched to share um, a cabin with me. Until <laughs> <laughs> I looked at my calendar, and yeah. I will, um, I will be uh, in uh, in lovely Huntsville, Alabama, ah, instead yes. of there. Um, but it, it sounds like a great Alabama, deal, and I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. You know, people for years have talked about doing you know a security hacker con on a boat. And uh, a lot of us have talked about doing it, and I'm really glad somebody else is doing, doing it. it. Yep. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, and it, it's a good crew, so... Uh, uh, Larry imagine is, uh, the, depth, the depth of the con funk that will occur. Larry is teaching SANS 617 Wireless Ethical Hacking and Defense coming up in Las Vegas September 14th through the 19th and the Pentest Hack Fest in November in Washington and lots more places. Check out... Go to securityweekly.com forward slash SANS and check out more offerings from the SANS Institute. And now we're on to the security news for this week. Where do we want to get started? Oh, I know where we we have to start with John McAfee for president. John (laughs) McAfee for president. We got to get shirts. (laughs) McAfee 2016. The only sane choice. That's what I wrote. I said he's the only sane choice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's I was being a little fussy, but you know, sane, insane. So the other, insane, the other insane. critically important. Uh, Mac- we love John. John's been on the show. Insane and, in the know, membrane. John has been on the show. It was a wonderful interview, and um, it was. And um, I like talking with John. I, I, the, the, I enjoy talking you, with you've John. You've hung out with John too. I've hung yeah. out with him a few times. Um, I have a, a couple of visions in in my head of the President McAfee, um, and I find entertainment <laughs> in them as well as some other things, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think you know, arguably, as we sit here drinking, um, and tonight was has not been a successful night for the cocktails, uh, but there's still booze. Um, better than my unsuccessful nights, put it that way. Your unsuccessful <laughs> nights are better than sometimes than my <laughs> successful nights. So. Um, John McAfee is also launching uh, <laughs> a, a line of uh, moonshine, I believe. We'll, we we well, may see that. We've started to start see some interesting tweets about. <coughs> we got to uh, get some of that. Some um, some McAfee moonshine, and you know that sort of um, that sort of uh, entrepreneurship is. Uh, why McAfee is McAfee, and mm-hmm. it's it's what the country was built on, and um, you know, you know, he McAfee does say, 2016. You know, he does say <laughs> that he has a huge underground following on the internet, and that, that's not an exaggeration. I no, mean, no, he has a huge not. following. And, uh, yeah, and you know, one of the, I, I think we've said this before. It may we may have come up on the podcast, but one of the things that uh, that you know, he is he is a flawed character, as we all are. 
some of his flaws may be a little bit more obvious to people than mm-hmm. others, uh, than others of us and others. But um, one of the things I really admire about him is that he's got the ability to recognize himself for who he is. Um, I, I was sitting in a bar with him and I said, you know, I like you, but you're batshit crazy. And his answer was, yes, yes, I am. Oh, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah, there's absolutely no, right. no... He's very transparent in that. It's just yeah, like, you know yeah, I no, I, it, this is who I am. This is what I've done. This is who I am. Um, you know, un, unlike that Clinton dude, I'm sure that Mr. McAfee knows how to smoke a joint, understands you're supposed to inhale, right? You know? <laughs> <laughs> or secure an email server. <laughs> Um, uh, you, know, you know, Jack. Yeah. Jack, I, I, I like the fact that he's raising um, the 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 big issue. I think that that the people are not really noticing, and that is that privacy is completely dead. And the fact that he's put that front and center um, actually um, uh, gets me encouraged a little bit. It actually is going to bring some visibility to the issue, whether whether he is the candidate of choice in the end or not. Well, did I even say that? What? You know, it, it may, may or not be the case, but but actually putting it on the map, I think, is 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 a really big deal, especially for the the generations below um, mine. Um, privacy is is something that people are not thinking about, and it's a big deal, a really big deal. So well, I, I think some it, people it think about is. it, but and they they don't uh, act upon it or really change their behavior. To, in an effort to have more privacy, which in today's age just ke- keeps getting more and more difficult. It, right. It here's, here's what I'm worried about. Though. What I'm worried about is that by putting it on the map, there's going to be a backlash of uh, uh, uneducated, ignorant uh, legislators doing the wrong things in response, in response to, to making it, yeah. this a very, very public uh, issue. And I hope that... Um, uh, John McAfee's ready to engage those people because I really would like to see that level of engagement. That would be uh, maybe not, in combination with the EFF and folks like that. Yeah, that would be not possible. that I. Um, I'm not saying I don't want to see him succeed. I'm not saying I do. I'm, I'm saying I like John. No, I like John. Yeah. I'm not saying he's the best presidential candidate, but he, he may be able to, um, in classic hacker tradition. Provide needed disruption. Yes, exactly on this yeah. topic. And you know, one of the things people are often dismissive of is paranoia, uh, of his privacy concerns and his paranoia. Uh, but I, I have spent some time with the man a couple of times. I've spent time with his security detail. Uh, we have mutual friends. Uh, I believe that he has some paranoid delusions. I also believe that there are people out to get him. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I know there are people. Now, whether they're trying to assassinate him all the time, I don't know about that, but there are people trying to to screw with John McAfee. Uh, There are people that do things to mess with him, Um, whether there are any current... So it is... I mean, he speaks from a perspective of actually having his life disrupted. There are all sorts of things there, and I think that there's great potential, you know, classic hacker potential for Mm -hmm. disruption, even if in the end um, he's dismissed, he can make it uncomfortable for people to ignore the, um, you know, erosion of privacy is overused, but to to ignore the abuse of privacy. Right. If nothing else, if his candidacy does does that and raises awareness, I think it's a positive thing. Exactly right. I I want to just switch gears really quick and talk about disclosure. Recently, there were zero-day vulnerabilities reported in Kaspersky and FireEye. And the way that these were disclosed wasn't necessarily, I don't know if I would call it the best way, the worst way. But what if you're disclosing zero-day vulnerabilities inside of products that people are using to help secure their environments. Say what you will about antivirus. I'm sure John Strand has some thoughts about that. But when you, <laughs> when you take a zero-day vulnerability for a product that people are using to detect bad things and you make it public, the attackers are going to use those things to bypass those products. 
is, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? How do we responsibly go about well, disclosing these vulnerabilities? Is it detrimental to do disclosure for these vulnerabilities and security products that people are using? So we had a, a Joff, actually, we'll probably know who this customer is. We had a number of customers where we found a vulnerability for command and control out of a number of different firewall products um, over DNS. And we had communicated with a number of vendors directly, and they were very nice. They were very polite. They would listen to us, and they'd say, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got that taken care of. And the next test, we find the exact same thing, and then the exact same thing, and then the exact same thing. And about two months ago, one of our customers got very, very frustrated with it, and he basically said, well, we're going to release this publicly to MSISEC. And within 24, 48 hours, they had a couple of sales representatives, regional managers at the customer location begging the customer not to release this information, and they managed to get it fixed relatively quickly. Um, what was Josh Wright's law on this, Paul? He said something like, you know, how quickly a vendor will patch a vulnerability in a product is, is relative to whether or not there's a Metasploit module for it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that that has a lot to do with it, too. There's a lot of security researchers, a number of them at BHIS included, I get sick and tired of seeing the same damn vulnerability again and again and again and again, going through responsible disclosure. Nothing gets done. But as soon as it becomes even slightly possible of getting public, then they freak out and do something about it. And there's that term, Mike, security he researcher. The, oh, he used the other R word, <laughs> responsible. <laughs> I hate the phrase responsible disclosure because responsible is it irresponsible <laughs> disclosure. Well, no, because responsible is traditionally used as a weapon against the researcher by an irresponsible vendor. It's it's a loaded yeah. term. I know it's no. accepted. It's yeah. it's yeah. like me arguing about what hacker means, but I, it's or just, security well, research. But, but, so John, well, here's another one that drives me nuts. Uh, yeah. And related though. It's like, "Oh, that's fixed." No, it's not. No, we we changed the configuration so customers can change that. Yeah. <laughs> no, right? that's not they fixed. Can now, yeah. They can now configure it away, but the defaults haven't changed. Uh, it's like, no, that's wrong. That's the possibility of you should. <laughs> <laughs> First yeah. of all, even making the default right and allowing them to screw up, uh, you probably need to get yeah, an excuse for. Right? But yeah, if that. in the case of something like, by default, when you turn on wireless, we use WPA to pre-shared key. Because assuming you have a radius server is a bad idea, even though that's what you should do, right? But the idea of defaulting to open or web is is not good, right? I I'll give you maybe you have you know you do need to offer open and web and whatever, but you need to default to secure. But yes, I, I have seen the oh you can now configure that problem away, but we're not going to change any settings or push that out in an update because it might break something, and then. Uh, support would get a phone call. Now, go, go, going yeah. back to the story, have, uh, in, in this specific case, one of them was, hey, let me release this on a Friday night. Hey, here's the O day. No, I have not talked with the vendor. No, I didn't give any heads up to the vendor. I'm just putting it out there. Here's the O day. The other one, yes, I work on one or two with the vendor. Oh, here's the rest of the bones. Pay me $10,000 per bone and I'll give you the bone which in my case, that is blackmail. Um, yep. They don't fit what you guys are talking about to a certain degree. One of them didn't just, didn't even give the vendor the chance of going like, hey, here's the bone, try to fix it. Oh, you, you were an asshole. Okay, now let me put it out. No, they didn't even give him the chance to be an right. asshole. That's irresponsible or be responsible. disclosure. Irresponsible yeah. disclosure. So, so we have one case where it was, you can argue responsible. He didn't put out the proof of concept. He just say, hey, here's the vulnerability. Hey, look, I got code execution. I don't know if he actually sent it over to Kaspersky or not. And in the but other that case... Wasn't, that wasn't... Which one was Tavis? Tavis was FireEye? Tavis Romani? No, Kaspersky. He was Kaspersky. Kaspersky. So he just yeah. released it. Yeah. Oh, he just released it and without giving it to Kaspersky? So or it, Tavis has, has done a, things... Yeah. He's which got a track record of doing weird me. disclosure things. However, yeah. I've had conversations in the past few years where I have a much greater understanding and borderline empathy for Tavis's impatience. Mm -hmm. um, unlike a lot of other people, Tavis has, well, first of all, I don't think anyone can argue that he's brilliant. Right. No, no. Um, I I think that 
uh, he has, in my opinion, he's been screwed over by vendors large and small so many times that his patience has uh, worn thin. Um, but, you know, I won't mention any specific company names, but I've had <coughs> conversations uh, uh, that yeah. have the previous things have led to him to saying, "I'm just going to release like, it." It's like, oh, knowing that um, I still am concerned for the impact on vo- on end users, but. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm and, still, and I'm, still uncomfor- I'm still uncomfortable with some of what he's done, but I have a lot more, if not sympathy, empathy for yeah. what he's, and that's very specific to Tavis because this guy breaks shit. Now you know sometimes you can argue there's motivation. You know he had an argument with Sophos, but the bugs he found with Sophos were real, right? And they were embarrassing, right? So. Others that don't have years, decade plus of track record of being screwed by vendors, Mm -hmm. large and small, um, give folks the benefit of the doubt until you've been burned as many times as as Tavis. Um, Like I said, not not that Tavis doesn't still frustrate me, but I have a lot more empathy for his situation than folks who haven't spent a decade at least doing these things mm-hmm. and having frustrations. Um, you you know, realize that's a level of nuance, Jack, that does Mike, not scare. Mike, you've been quiet. I want, I want to hear Mike wait. Yeah, I'm, it just, I, I find the whole thing absolutely fascinating to me. I, it's, we, there's a lot of inside baseball there that I, I didn't know any of that till you just said it, and I'm not sure how much of it matters. It, it, it's... Um, well, so that's you, a good I mean, point. You guys, like, does it matter? You, you, does it matter if you, I release You guys it can guess one of the companies that that has screwed Tavis over while trying to work with them <laughs> simultaneously. We've had people from that sure. company on. You know who it is. It's the largest software Microsoft. distributor yeah. Yeah. in the no, world, right? Yeah. And there have been teams work actively working against him there, while other people were actively working for him. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, and that doesn't excuse anybody's behavior, but I have, like I said, I have empathy for that when you're in there and people that yeah. are, you know, that ha- that are or were at Microsoft have have given me perspective on that. And yes, that's a level of nuance that outside of this audience mm-hmm. and and this, you know, because I assume that the folks that are that are listening, I know that most people listening understand some level of nuance and have these frustrations on different scales themselves. Um, I had it on the last past Tuesday, uh, on the last, <coughs> in the past Tuesday before the last one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and then, well, then we have situations where it was reported that GM took five years to fix a critical vulnerability. Well, one yeah, that I would deem is critical, a full takeover uh, on wait, millions uh, of OnStar <coughs> cars. Five so, years. So wait. Five Go years. Go ahead and try to act surprised in about a software vulnerability <laughs> in light of the ignition key vulner the ignition switch vulnerability. You know, I, coincidentally enough, my, my, my nine-year-old GM vehicle has an active recall. <laughs> it got affected. I brought in my recall notice, and they said, yep, you got to pay us 500 bucks to fix it. And yeah. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a recall. I'm totally baffled by this. The answer is, well, we haven't solved it yet. So you got to pay us, but you know, wink, wink, we'll pay you back. We promise. And I couldn't get anybody to put that in writing. So this is, this is the one time when, uh, you're not going to get me to defend GM for even a second here. Screw them. Wow. Well, okay. So wait a minute, but but we have to reconcile these two things, right? On one side, you have vendors that just don't bother patching things forever. And then on the other side, you got a security researcher that's been around the block a number of times who's just gotten to the point where he says, screw it. I'm just going to release it publicly. So we can easily say that the answer is somewhere in between. Where is that? Because I will, I will speak from experience. Trying to do any type of disclosure to a company is an absolute freaking nightmare. If yeah. you try to follow a quote unquote responsible disclosure, they want Sorry, your lawyers it, it, to sign an NDA, and as soon as or lawyers want you to sign an NDA, and as soon as you sign an NDA, many corporate attorneys think the problem is gone because yeah, they're not I, worried you know, about it. And, and this is. This is, we should bring this back. I know we made an attempt before. This is where (laughs) I think, and this is personal opinion, I think that 
the various bug programs, bug bounty programs, mm-hmm. and managed bug hunt programs, whether you call them bounties or other things, uh, have an opportunity to to help because there's a broker. You know, in past, yes. in yep. the yeah. past, there, be there have been things. The brokers have been. Well, let you know, me let's, use a different let's word. Let's get in the Wayback Machine and go to Wabi Sabi Lobby and, you know, the, selling these things. On, what if we have somebody that is experienced with... Wow, Wabi Sabi Lobby. Wow. <laughs> Jeez, where did that... Took me back, dude. <laughs> There's a sweeper about that somewhere in the archives of the show, too. Right, so <laughs> selling... Wabi Lobby Sabi? Wabi Sabi Lobby? Wabi Wabi Sabi Sabi Lobby? There was know. a sweeper where we yeah, said it wrong yeah. like eight times. Yeah, I said Wabi <laughs> Lobby. Wabi Sabi Lobby? Whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> it's a sloppy, sloppy lobby. lobby. Look up sloppy lobby on <laughs> Encyclopedia <laughs> Dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's there's, like there's got to be Sloppy. you know a way, and whether it's reporting it to a cert well, or whether yeah, it's no, we'll think about this though. Let, let's let's stay on that path. We, we said the word broker. Broker is interesting. Let's use a different word. Arbiter. Yeah, yeah, you know, great. W- the, the time you guys got me all riled up on this, or I got myself riled up, or whatever it was, you're self you know, riling. Probably the, the, the thing. <laughs> well, but the thing you're I like took away watches. from it. You just in fact, I, I, I have a new a new layer tonight. Um, I'll just say that that there's. Uh, I, I figured out one of the things that we're missing. When we use the term security researcher, and it's there's no ethical canons uh, that that we uh, widely uh, agree to. So if you're pissed off don't at a company, make yeah, me no, say call it, call it research. No, no, please don't. No, Jack, no, that's not right, the direction. Ceh, I'm going. right? C-E- no. Oh, Jack, no. Let's go out of the security industry and look at what other people do. It, which goes back to then. There's some sort of a governance process. There's an arbiter of it, and um, I don't want that to be the government. So then, what is the what's the option? Because you know what, Jack, you've got some of that inside baseball knowledge uh, or some of that nuance. So obviously, I recommend you for whatever council gets formed up. But you know what? You're right. You've got you've got the bug bounty programs. You have software vendors that that I think have a stake in it, whether we like them or not. Um, and then we have folks that are independent, folks that are working for corporations. There's There needs to be some way to collectively come together so that somebody who has, they discover something, uh, there, there's a way to vet it, there's a way to handle it. And there's somebody, there's almost like, um, I don't want to use the, the uh, analogy of a jury, but there's some sort of a process where you have the different interests that get a chance to vet it out at some way. And, and hook- ah! Sorry, my head just Fair exploded. Enough. Well, I mean, I, look, the way that we're doing it is, uh, is, is not workable. And it's not healthy. This no, is no. going to degrade faster than we think. No, no, no. But, but, so it, it hasn't changed much. You know, if I could see some type of point where it's degrading or it's improving, I, I would agree with you. You know, the, the call to action that we have to do something. But this is the way the game's been played for about 10 years. And the pendulum goes back and forth. Organizations get all bent out of shape like Oracle did a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then whenever he released this vulnerability, it, you know, Kaspersky basically came out rather than being like, ah, we're all mad. Um, they said, we would like to thank uh, Tavis for reporting us to a buffer overflow vulnerability, which our specialist fixed, within 24 hours. And his main point about this was he released it publicly and it was fixed in 24 hours. Can we have arbiters? Can we have panels? Can we have people get together to discuss this stuff and have it fixed within 24 hours under a quote-unquote responsible disclosure? Probably not. I'm not saying, hey, we should do full disclosure on absolutely everything, but you have to admit that if you go the full disclosure route, that it always gets fixed faster than it does if you try to do a quote-unquote responsible disclosure path. Oh, you know what? That's, I, I, that's been true for the stipulate. past ten years. For the past ten years, we've talked about vulnerabilities, and what John said has always been true. And I'm not saying that's the, the we sh- we need to go the next ten years with that same well, mantra. Look, I, something needs I, to change. I, I, I defer to your expertise. Look, John, John and I haven't really had this conversation. So when I when I get to these, I, I I'm interested in finding workable solutions. I don't understand all the nuances to it sometimes. So that's actually some some really good stuff. Here's the thing I stipulate with it, though, and it's the same thing. I, I don't want to be caught defending GM in any way, but you know, there's somebody who has a broader field of view, and ostensibly they're prioritizing where limited resources go in order to fix things. So if, if a company fixes something in 24 hours, that's great. I guess. But the question is, was that the best use of the resources? Was it prioritized correctly? Or did that create a cascading problem someplace else? When it's a company, a security company fixing a bug in 24 hours, eh, it probably is great. A uh, car company 
five years? I don't know. It feels long to me. So they're, they're, I, I, all I like to point out in, in this stuff sometimes is that when we force somebody's hand, the, we pride ourselves on a result, but that result may not have been optimal and it may not have been the best choice. It's just so, the choice that they got forced into. Well, I think that throughout history, if we try and draw some analogies, you know, calling someone's baby ugly and finding a vulnerability is always a difficult thing. Yeah. Really, yeah. You know, it, when it, they go to the NFL and say, you know, there's a concussion problem. Like their first reaction is there's no problem. When you go to the car industry and say, Jack, there's some safety there, problem. Right. When you and go to as, the cigarette industry I and say cigarettes are bad for you, sooner right? Sooner or later, every time we talk about cars, I, it <laughs> comes back to one of the things that everyone needs to understand is that the auto industry puts a dollar value on human life in a way that is only rivaled by companies that do life insurance, right? I mean, it's yeah. that. No, it's, but it's a similar and thing because to that, it's, and, and you can't I'm be an not auto. To talk about cars. Right. You can't. Yeah, but that's like be, an econ- that's, But that's you can't be econ an tool auto. One. Right. But you can't be in the auto industry and not do that, right? You, I mean, right. You, it's the nature of. One of the most deadly creations of mankind. Uh, you know, it pops people off in small numbers, but the aggregate number is pretty fucking impressive compared to you know weapons no, it's of mass still, destruction. It's still be yeah, a pretty like right. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, it, and that's the what it takes. So yeah, and Michael, you're you're right. Um, and as everybody knows, and I make clear, I have no sympathy for. <laughs> it just. Burn, just fucking burn. No, no, but so the, the point—the point you guys are trying to make, I think, is that we're that trying to make the, a point. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you are. Oh, that Jesus, are. we must be drunk. It's uh, maybe I'm, I'm to retire. Point, uh, maybe, I, maybe I'm extrapolating <laughs> a little bit too much here, but but I think the extrapolation is that that it's always going to be weighed against the uh, the overall financial impact of the company, and if that security mm. risk or that vulnerability is is a very minor financial impact to the company, they're not going to really pay attention to it. Or I mean, they're going to say, well, if it has big impacts in their bottom line, they're going to try and bury it. Is all yeah. So so hold on. There's there's two on there's two nuances though, right? The first of which is we're suggesting that that impact can be properly calculated and expressed, and that's a that's a a challenge in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we're looking at too is that that's that's predicated on people making effective decisions in organizations. I think history suggests that's a little elusive too, but that would further presume that we have good, accurate information in context. Jack, you started the show earlier talking about the importance of stories and telling the right story. Yeah. Uh, so it, when when I say things like that, I'm not actually suggesting that otherwise the company would have made a, a prime decision in a, a, a good time frame or anything else. All I'm saying is I think that as an industry, we would be benefited to step back from time to time and say, okay, we have a very narrow field of view. We, we pretend it's the big field of view, but we, we, for the most part, have a pretty narrow field of view. And sometimes we just need to step back a little bit, take a gander, consider how other people have solved things like this, and then head back into it. That's all. Yeah, yeah. well, that was actually partially my point, Michael, that you just you reinforced, that, that we have a specific narrow uh, entity in the overall picture and it's going to be assessed against the global context rather than just the context in which we consider it important. And, and that's, that's the overall issue that we got, we've got we to deal with. Uh, yes. Where did Paul go? I missed I got a, yeah. I, I, got, I got a quote and not trying to win or anything, but I think <laughs> that this quote is interesting. John wins. Um, no. so, yeah, you so, win. You find a quote, you so, win. But <laughs> this is uh, – this is for the uh, FireEye stuff, and I'm, I'm reading this because I, I think it opens up another interesting conversation avenue uh, to kind of move it a little bit. Um, so this goes with Eric Hermanison's uh, FireEye vulnerabilities that he discovered, and he was working with Ron uh, Paris, and they said that they found 32 vulnerabilities in FireEye's product uh, with multiple root, remote root issues. And he said, I tried for 18 months to work with FireEye through the responsible channels, and they balked every time. These issues need to be released because the platforms are wrought with vulnerabilities and the community needs to know. Especially these are government-approved safe harbor devices with glaring remote root vulnerabilities. And then he came so far as to say, no one should be trusting these devices on their network if FireEye can't be bothered to fix these problems. Now, moving away from the responsible disclosure thing, I, I got to say, that is a lot of vulnerabilities found by a couple of security researchers, especially in the day of uh, you know, structured exception handling address-based layout randomization, data execution prevention. 
I, I would just like to throw this out there to you guys. What the hell is going on? I mean, we usually don't see vulnerability counts that high in modern, very heavily used security products. Is it just that there's a lot of old code under the hood? Uh, I'm kind of is throwing it because this to the Carlos's way. But is it because yeah. the consumers aren't looking for that? The consumers are buying products such – I hate to single out FireEye, but they're buying products because of the problems they solve without necessarily looking for any problems that they might introduce. It's not the mindset that we have today. There's another story in there, and actually this is actually a good segue – where Windows 10 has a lot more security features. And the headline of the article read, will new security features on Windows win users over? Did it take 15 years? So Windows for Microsoft- chip and pin. Awesome. It's chip and pin. Did it take yeah, 15 years to make security, <laughs> like a security part of the purchase decision now? Do people want to buy at Windows? Do they want to upgrade to Windows 10 because there's security in it? No. No, no, nope. yeah. but to it. corporate, so end users Here maybe s- not, but do corporations say no? Because corporations they're already are, on Windows. They don't. They're, they're corporations are on Windows Seven, and they're not going to go to Ten because there's more security features. So it's no I, part I, I of would, the. I would love there. Yeah, to be, they're going to go to Ten for a lot of t- reasons. There's so two things. There, I mean, there's so purchase there, and upgrade so are two different things. First of all, I, I got into this discussion last night at an. Well, Windows Ten has to work. All right, one of the things that's really wrong with this industry. <laughs> yes, Rick. Why the crack? Why the crack? One of the things that's Bold really strength. wrong with this industry, <laughs> especially that's once great. you get to a point where you are able to share, is that you can't fucking share. Because you go to NDA events and spend hours within looking under the hood of shit. And was, but um, there was a conversation last night where somebody talked about Microsoft technologies and and how irrelevant they were because he worked exclusively in the startup world where nobody uses anything but Macs. Oh, wait, wait, wait. So wait. he immediately could, stood up and said, and, and I said, that's really significant if you live in that world. However, more people use Windows 10 than the current release of OS X. Yep. And so not there all, were not people all OS X combined. You mean OS ten Yosemite? The, Windows no, 10. no, the, the one before, the most widely deployed. Anyway, oh, okay. But yeah, it's it's um, Carlos. Do you remember the exact numbers? I know you saw, but Windows ten adoption is extremely high for it, and it's because it's free, <clears throat> right? So right. I'm running. Windows 10. Um, I can feel Inle- In less than one month, it was 75 million uh, But it's free. Wow. It got people, it got people wow. off of Windows 8, 8, 1, 7, 8, and 8, 1. Uh, well, Windows 8, people were itching to get off that to get at anything so, else. So Windows 10 is wonderful if you were on Windows 8 and mm-hmm. suffered through the horror of that. And then Windows 8, 1 made you think... Well, if that. I have to, I can live with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you move to 10, with the exception of on laptops, touchscreen devices, I was programmed to slide this thingy over, and then I had this list of you wireless stuff, access points, right. and I would touch the one I wanted to join, and now when I slide it over, it tells me about fucking Outlook, which does me no fucking good <laughs> until I can connect to the fucking wireless. <laughs> <laughs> because you, because you were one of the minority that got used to Windows 8. <laughs> yeah, I was one of the minority oh, that used 8, eight, and <laughs> eight one and actually tried to learn the thing. Um, <laughs> just have, I'm just envisioning yeah, but, this but, montage but of Jack say, Daniel you. video. Jack Daniel on Windows 10. <laughs> fucking slider with the fucking Outlook. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd have to, I've been so, playing with the so yes, card Microsoft, with thank card you so it. much <laughs> for making instantly available obsolete email information <sighs> instead of relevant wireless information. Well, it's more uh, secure because you're not connected to any wireless networks. <laughs> this this is true, and it's <laughs> but the thing is, it's an Apple it's it's an Apple kind of thing to say <laughs> you want the latest and greatest and to be secure. And to have your workflow shattered, you buy you buy or get free the new shit. Oh, you you like your existing workflow? 
I guess you get to be insecure. Fuck you. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, right? I, I, and, and it's, at least I mean, Microsoft it's not just that, you know, Microsoft doesn't just steal from Apple. I mean, the... Um, the, 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 w- new WDC, tablet, the, yeah. the WWDC yesterday announced the surface. The, the surface, Apple Surface. Yeah, right? The surface. iSurface. Yes. Um, it's like, although, all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, I want a bigger tablet with a keyboard now. And with a stylus. Oh, no. no. Yeah, with a stylus. Wait, I tablets hope, have I stylus? Oh, my God. I hope for the sake of Apple <laughs> users. That that keyboard is not the steaming pile of crap that Surface keyboards are. <laughs> Just oh. I, I share that a same joke. Home <laughs> For, if yeah. you're a road warrior and try to use devices on your lap or sprawled on your fat gut in your hotel room while you're trying to sleep because you're in the wrong. Just, I defy you to try that with a Surface laptop of any sort. Well, I can tell you, the I've Apple keyboard will look to, better than the I, Surface I, I, I have, keyboard. I have used my iPad Bluetooth uh, keyboard with my Surface so that I had a keyboard that I could set over here when, you know, passed out trying to make do with three hours of sleep a week or whatever the hell when you get into full road warrior mode. So and Apple if I go Windows, I go the XPS 13 from Dell. That's that's a nice machine. I I uh, I am extremely fond of my Yoga too. Um, this has replaced. <coughs> I have a Yoga at home, for instance, pretty cool. Now, uh, n- now, Jack, one of the f- um, even though I use I'm right now on a Mac and I use a Mac and also I have a Linux box here and I have a Windows box here. Um, one of the things I actually hate from Apple is that. They're so secretive. They won't share information. They're close lip. They won't work with the researcher in any way, shape, or form. While in the case of, let's say, Microsoft, yeah, one group may screw you, the other may work with you, but at least you have a conversation back and forth to a certain degree, certain level. In the case of <laughs> Apple, you don't get that. The, uh, their sustainability comes out. Hey, here's your sustainability. Yes, it's being exploited. Apple, do you have any comment? No. Are you working on fixing this? No comment. Complete radio silence. Microsoft will at least say, we're working on a patch. We'll probably do an out of band. Oh, just wait for the next patch Tuesday. And you get some feedback back. You, you, you get that back and forth. With Apple, you don't get that. That's one of the problems that they, have at, that they haven't fixed. Yes, iOS is more secure than Android. Uh, but... God, at least have a, a, a bit of courtesy. That's what I'm expecting from Apple. Now that security and um, privacy are the spiel for selling stuff. And I also want to say to the security <coughs> industry, Jack may have many problems with you, but I personally love you just the way you are. Don't change. <laughs> nice, John. <laughs> nice. Um, I, I just... To clarify, I, love chaos. I mean, all of this. Just down to, to clarify I've my position. Of, You're sitting down, you, Jack. We can tell. That. I I love you all, but fuck you all, right? <laughs> we we, yeah. are, we are all broken, right? Oh, yeah. And uh, all I embrace that. <laughs> um, uh, I I hate the <laughs> I Jack hate Daniel the on relationships. Choose. I love you all, but fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? I should just quit it's there. Like Jack Handy's <laughs> no, no, no. Like Keep going. Deep thoughts with Jack Handy. This is deep thoughts with deep Jack thoughts. Daniel. Jack Handy. <laughs> and just just two weeks ago, weren't we singing Kumbaya and holding hands with Jack? Oh, that was just a fleeting moment. <laughs> That Apparently, was, <laughs> that was a drug-induced. You inspired coma. me to write, a, right, write an so article a, about a it. And everything, of, Jack. Right, a couple of you know <clears throat> what induced that. So anyway. Um, yeah, and, and I corrected within the first story in the news that yes, night. Yes, you overcompensated. I overcompensated. Yes. I, I left the pump on too long. I mean, um, I went out and bought a cigarette boat and a big truck. No, I. Um, yeah. Wow. Um, so Yahoo, 
refuses to fix an emoticon exploit in Messenger. I thought this was kind of funny. There's an exploit that if you install custom emoticons in Yahoo Messenger. <laughs> I'm trying to say this with a straight face, Jack. <laughs> All right. Look that way. I'll look this way. <laughs> so if you put custom emoticons in your Yahoo Messenger, there is a vulnerability. And Yahoo refuses to fix it because... The product is end of life. I was and say, I know that hey, all of us use it. And to because install. the three people using it are on Windows 10 and thus secure. And the um, one person okay. who uses it who likes to install <laughs> custom emoticons. <laughs> don't you, ICQ uh, doesn't has every, more don't you install Yahoo custom Messenger. emoticons in whatever instant messaging app you're using? Absolutely. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, All right I'm need, done. I'm closing need, the laptop. <laughs> I, I got a rant. Listen, so if we you're a Jack uh, Daniel emoticon, I need a ja- like Jack Daniel emoticon. What's it, your response be, to that? It would Jack be Daniel. very similar to the Lewis Black emoticon, <laughs> which looks very similar to a Massachusetts <laughs> driver emoticon. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, fuck. Uh, uh, the just, other day, uh, I was, the other day, I was cutting a lot of meat for the grill. I almost cut off one of my middle fingers, and I was terrified because I would have to turn into my Massachusetts driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, moving on to the next. Uh, so, ten things to do before you lose your laptop. Um, I boiled this down to really just two or things. Or spill booze in it. Um, I said really just two things. One, encrypt your hard drive. And two, never lose your laptop. I and flip three, the, I if there's the any order, questions, yes. refer, refer to one or two. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I, to, I, I to your point, too. And encrypt your backup. Yeah, I was going to say, Carlos is right on the money. To, to your point, up. too, I, I <laughs> was in this meeting last night that had a variety of experts in a variety of fields. <sighs> and uh, I was You asked, were in a porn chat room? I was <laughs> in a variety of different technology verticals. Um, Said, and buddy. I was asked for almost three straight hours if I was leaving. Verticals, horizontals. Horizontals, yeah. I was asked for almost three straight <coughs> hours if I was leaving. And that was because, you you all know this one, right? Because you've, you've been in this weird situation. I had my backpack on because my laptop's in my backpack. Mm-hmm. And I had one phone in my pocket, but since I split phones between work and which I treat very carefully, and personal, which I treat less carefully. So, like, I had phone, and I had sensitive things in my laptop and backpack and Mm -hmm. phone, and then I had a phone in my pocket, and so I don't put in a room full of people I trust. I don't put my backpack down and walk away from it. Right. The rest of these technology professionals are like, oh, you're on your way out? It's like, no, no. And finally, I had to start saying, oh, See, I'm a security guy. We we don't leave. We don't our, leave our laptops. We don't leave our laptops. We we'll, we'll leave temp, team members behind, but we won't leave our laptops. <laughs> 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 leave fuck, the te- fuck the team. But I'm not my leaving laptop. my laptop. <laughs> uh, so yes, <laughs> don't oh. lose it. But it's encrypted. Dude, that, when to you me, do. that is the most nerve wracking <clears throat> thing about going through TSA. Is the time that I have to spend yep. without oh, my oh, laptop yeah. being You're, within reach of my hands? Yeah. yeah. I, I, but when I you learn so that that out. TSA collects ten thousand laptops a week that get abandoned at a, a checkpoint, uh, ten thousand a week. <laughs> How? Who I don't. Is, even, I can't even who, begin to understand. Who has that. had a TSA agent yell at you as you walk away? Yep. Trying to Been give there. you somebody else's laptop. That yeah. hasn't happened to me. Done that. Yeah, that doesn't. I must not that. travel from the cool airports. Yeah, because it's. Yeah. I've. I've. It only happens to me when I travel with more than one laptop, <laughs> and <laughs> I have. Jack's that guy. You have any laptops to declare? I got this one. I got. And, and you yeah, hold on. Bag? I think I got a little bit of my pocket back here. Yeah, stacks. Yeah. Yeah. stacks the TSA, laptops. And yeah. the TSA pre lane is closed. You know, so. You, you pull the laptops out, but it, it's I, I've had it happen a few times. You're like, oh, you forgot one of your laptops because once you're more than one, you're one of those people. Right? Mm-hmm. You're um, one of those people. But no, no, if you had TSA try to separate you from you your laptop, oh, a lot. Yeah, and they get really <laughs> mad. And I'm like, 
No, fuck you. I am not leaving my. I'm not. So I'm I've had this it for dear life. Right? I've had this conversation, <coughs> which I love is when they ask why. Do we, Go ahead, John. Why do you need so many? I, I love the question they ask. Why do you need so many? Just say because I like taking out multiple laptops when I go through TSA. So, yeah, just I, to piss you off. I have challenged them yeah. that I am out of sight of my belongings. And they're like, mm. that's okay, that's policy. No. And I say, first of all... It's not my policy. <laughs> if I can have access to my bag, I will show you the printout of your latest directive leaked to the internet. But more importantly... If you will listen for a moment to the PA system, the lady in the air is telling me that I should never lose contact. She doesn't say I should trust the TSA. She says I should never allow my property out of my possession. Right. And you're like, Arr! and uh, it, I, I'm not saying it was a factor in acquiring my. Yeah, New what bag, is this now? This is but like I have a pelican, serious, dude. I have a pelican like, backpack this. that I can jam a padlock like, on the laptop section. Wow, you that could, is badass. That look is, at the, it is boss. not the most comfortable laptop. My 15-year-old, I don't know who made it originally, but it has a pelican case. Now, I wouldn't go more than you know a couple feet underwater for more than a minute or two, uh, but it's... It, it has two key functions. It's got a r very rugged storage facility. The front storage pocket even has some. Like the front storage pocket has a cage for your tablet, but then <clears> it's got this huge cavern for clothing. So it's my. But it lets me. Really? Put a, Ladies' underwear? Yeah. Really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you feel pretty. I'm not judging. Hey, I'm not Listen, judging, all right? You do what you want to feel pretty. <laughs> I do what I want to feel pretty. Dude, that's awesome. I like it. I, that's very impressive. It's you know, it's 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 ugly, but oh yeah, and Dude, it's, it's, like you could mess <laughs> someone up with that. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I have given no Doubles thought. Doubles a weapon. <laughs> I have given no thought to the stability of this handle and the mass of this thing yes. with a lightweight <laughs> laptop as a weapon hasn't even occurred to me. Um, that's cool. Front and back is padded, but if you caught the side of that thing, you'd go down fucking not, hard. Not, it's not <laughs> very comfortable though. Actually, uh, it will be once these pads break into my... Yeah. It's actually pretty good. And because there's this big open space... It breathes a little? It breathes mm. better than most. Yep. But these are stupid expensive. However, the last time I What's bought What's stupid a, expensive? A couple hundred bucks if you find them right. Nah, it's not stupid expensive. It's not. Really, it's, it's a couple hundred bucks. Bags for, for us to travel as much as we do. Oh, a couple wait, hundred bucks oh, is well worth it. you've got money to burn? Have you been, That's, like, burning $100? No, like, Joss and John will no, have no. a couple of those because no, they no. just have money, <laughs> money to burn. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so no, that gives... just budget that, for beer and computers. Th That's this right. gives me uh, d beer in computers or beer and computers? <laughs> beer <laughs> and and <laughs> okay, and all right. All right. <laughs> Good. Pick. So I, I have to say this like every couple of months. Uh, I have to say this every couple of months. So we blather on, but there's like other stuff that Paul and sometimes me and others have put in for news stories. If you're trying to keep up, like take a look at stories for the week because there's stuff. There's stuff. There's, yeah. there's like security there's news in there. We're just talking. News we're just talking about bags now. Right, we're talking about bags. It, it, so anyway, this is not the most rugged thing, but it'll you know it'll hold a 15 inch ultra book, or it, they claim a 17 inch Apple thing. Um, it, but yeah, it, it's it's like um, it's like buying Tumi or Pelican gear. For most people, it's dumb to spend that much money. Right. <clears throat> However, for some people, it it's great. I have a Tumi bag. I spent. Too many Marriott points on or whatever. But holy crap, it's like a TARDIS. It's a little tiny thing. I can put more shit in it than mm -hmm, belongs mm -hmm. there. But if you don't travel, don't waste the money. Pelican. Don't travel in Pelican. Man, you, you're out. You're overweight before you know it, right? Yeah. The, 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 care, the uh, checked baggage size <coughs> big Pelican is like eight. I forget. It's like 18 or 19 pounds empty. So you right. hit 50 pounds. Boom. Oh. However, I, you know, Jack, you've probably experienced this, but uh, in the U.S., the overweight thing, not as much of a big deal, right? You get outside the U.S., oh, oh my shit. God, they will bang you on overweight. You're finished. <laughs> so, 
So the road warriors among the audience will appreciate this one, where you carry the the scales so you know when you're getting overweight, and you have your 83-pound backpack so that your bag is 49.86 ounces. <laughs> I mean, 49.86 pounds, right? So you don't get <coughs> stiffed on the fee. And then you have the classic American scale, which says it weighs 41 pounds, because they, they don't want to have the argument, right? So they dial it way down. I'm like, wait, can I... Take 10 pounds out of this piece of shit. Oh my Can't God. Wait. I got nine pounds of gear I want to put in there. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I mean, you know, if you're overweight, they always give you the opportunity to take stuff, stuff out. out. But, right. but that thing's on the belt, zipping away to be sodomized by the baggage savages <laughs> <laughs> before you know it if it's underweight. <laughs> Why does your travel backpack has a frame? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it does. It's. It's impressive, dude. <laughs> Why? Yeah, and, and the other thing about this four road where is is you can't see it, but this that's a twenty five liter pocket. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I can. You can I put could, a lot of booze in there. I could put. <laughs> stop, I, stop, I, 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 I can just it in liters. <laughs> I, I it. line it with plastic. I can make a gigantic cocktail, and it gets me through no, my no, flight. No, no, you got to do it three ounces at a time, fitting in a one quart bag. Right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like well, you can get yeah. the three liter bags. Why, these why are Why are all these back. nip bottles labeled uh, shampoo and conditioner? <laughs> 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 It's such oh, a little dip of Jack Daniels. Dude, that's my own brand of conditioner. Mm, conditioner. What are you t- look at my yeah, beard. I got my own brand of Which reminds me. Beard oil. <laughs> after oh, the show, talk, we, after the show, we need to talk about shampoo. Um, yeah, are we talking about <laughs> information we're security not streaming or recording. <laughs> okay. I have a shampoo story. We, we're not talking about security anymore. <laughs> yeah, is there any security conversation in this? <laughs> no, man, Take the curious. shampoo bottle like a dog and your leg. save it for after the show. Let it go. Okay. So hey John, so, hey, um, hey John, it's great having you on the show. Even yeah. though we don't let you talk as much this as we was, should, uh, this was fun. I think. Oh, that's um, cool. You probably you probably shouldn't, to be honest. So, <laughs> um, so no. John, <laughs> I'm sorry. We should. I'm just, um, I'm we just gonna, sitting here wondering. <laughs> okay, I want to ask about the cocktails. What do you guys have for cocktails this week? You um, bitched about the cocktails, but you didn't. You didn't say what you were drinking. So, and I would say that your we, cocktails. Has I have an empty changed. glass. So, so there was, what was in here? Um, that was a, a Manhattan? Manhattan. Excuse me, Manhattan like <laughs> no, <a> Manhattan, <laughs> Manhattan like drink. Uh, but we didn't have enough sweet vermouth, <clears throat> and we didn't have. It was still good though. It, it was. It was a little drier than I would normally do a Manhattan. Um, I did a Pim's cup, but. I should have not Is that used lemonade in Pims. Yeah, lemonade, ginger ale, iced tea, whatever you you want. Gotcha. Um, I made the mistake of just emptying the remains of a bottle of lemonade that I opened last week to make uh, drinks. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't in the refrigerator, Jack. <laughs> and, you, and you're wondering why it didn't turn out. <laughs> uh, also, the Pims has. What's the been mixture in the on the Pims cup? One one part Pims, two parts lemonade. It's whatever. It, it's all over the place. Gotcha. I. I like it a, a lot of pims because it's low alcohol. It's not a high alcohol. So you could drink. do half and half. So it would probably be part of the problem is probably that pims has not been refrigerated. Um, uh, whatever you know, it's uh, whatever. Do you shake it or stir it? Stir, stir. Gotcha. I'm gonna make that next. All right. So we're jo- we you got a webcast uh, sacred <coughs> cash cow AV bypass stuff. Is that that's not tomorrow, right? That, dude, that is absolutely tomorrow. That We've is already tomorrow. got about 650 people registered. It's going to wow. be really, really fun. Uh, nice. So two quick things. So, One, we actually had listeners submitting how to bypass different AV engines. So we had users, oh, uh, listeners awesome. submit for Sophos. We had listeners submit for WebRoot, and that's great. The, the thing that I'm really excited about is uh, AV Apocalypse. Uh, there's some researchers out of Brazil, we'll talk about this, that have found a way for almost all of the major AV a- a- engines to basically attack themselves. It's an autoimmune attack against the system. So you can basically spread files throughout the system, or rather uh, insert code into files, and the AV engine will literally start killing the individual <laughs> system. We'll talk about oh that. Oh, my God, that's awesome. Um, we'll talk about, uh, Joff, what was it, uh, the the stuff from Steve Sims, the one no-op instruction? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. disassembled. Uh, and, assembly ghost, yeah, so assembly go ghost ahead. writing on payloads. Uh, no up instruction modification and template modification. Uh, yeah, total game over. So, and John, stuff. you said you you have a tech segment for so, next week. 
I do. Next week, if I can get on the show quick enough, I'm going to be teaching at Sands Las Vegas with, uh, with Larry. But I'm hoping to try to jump on. Um, if not, it'll be the week after. I want to talk about Better Cap, which is uh, kind of a, a, a really easy to use Ruby framework utility for replacing Editor Cap, which, as you know, the guys behind Editor Cap have been a little bit busy the past couple of months doing <clears throat> other things. Um, but, uh, but no, Better Cap is really cool. It's very, very simple to use. You get on a wireless network, you fire it up, and a lot of the Editor Cap functions just start. It's configurable. I am not exactly happy that it's written in Ruby, but uh, all things told, it's a great framework, and we'll be talking about that here the week after. Sweet. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks to all of the illustrious hosts on the show tonight uh, for helping us. Uh, thanks to Micah for coming on the show. And we'll see everyone next Micah. week. Don't forget October 16th, 10-year anniversary, over and out.